Thanks for coming. I'd like to introduce a, um, a collaborator of mine, Professor William Shu, uh, from Taiwan. He's from the National Taiwan Ocean University. Um, the story of how we actually met and, and sort of uh, made the contact was I was running the um, in information and communication technologies for small scale fisheries project for FAO and was, was looking around for people active in this field. And despite trying to hide uh, from global <laughs> attention, um, I came across a, a, a iFish, which is one of his projects for full monitoring um, vessels at sea. And I contacted him and invited him at the end of last year to the practitioner's sort of experts workshop, uh, which they came to. Um, and then subsequently have learned more and more about, about uh, the, the lab's work and about what he's going to present today, which is really fascinating. It's kind of at the cutting edge of, of uh, big data approaches um, and GIS and a lot of these things that, you'll, that will become more and more um, part of our everyday sort of monitoring and, and management of, of fisheries and aquaculture. Um, so uh, please give him a welcome and we, we look forward to your talk. Thanks very much for coming. Well, good morning everybody. So Alex has just gave an introduction of what I do. So actually I'm a computer scientist. I'm not a biologist and I'm not a fisheries expert but I, I also been in fisheries department starting from last November. So yeah, you can also call me a fisher, fisheries professor who accidentally know how to program. You can call me that. So just, we only have around 40 minutes. So I'll try to be as brief as I can, try to explain what my lab and my team does. So we'll give a simple introduction of my team and what they do. And I'm gonna divide this talk into uh, three different sections, the coastal and offshore sections, and the data analytics, and what we do with the data, and another, the oversea and deep sea sections. So actually, in our lab, we hold every single fishing data in Taiwan. So this is the actual evolution of the project. It started from 2000, year, year 2000, where the VMS systems were installed on fishing boats. Why was that? It's because the RFMOs required fishing boats that go in overseas, they have to be tracked. So it started from 2000, and I don't know, I forgot what I was doing back then, maybe on my master's degree. And on 2007, it started another project, it's called the VDR systems, which um, Worldfish would be much more interested in because the VDR system monitors those coastal and smaller fishing vessels. And it's installed on boats, similarly what Alex does right now in timor Leste. And from 2014, that's the major turning point of our group. We received the first project of trying to, um, to sort out the VDR data that's collected by our fisheries agencies. And those data were too large, and the governments could not analyze those data. So they told and asked our team, see if we could do something with it. And we took the project, and within three months, we organized the data into a query database system. And it came out quite well. So from this part, we got another project got another project and it sorts out the fishing data according to the landing data or the marketing data. And we try to compute information and which I will show you in the following slides. And in addition, in 2006, what happened to Taiwan is that Taiwan was listed in the IUU from the European Commission. So this is actually a devastating verdict that the European nation gave to Taiwan. So Taiwan has to take measures to monitor overseas fisheries. So our team got this large project trying to integrate every single fishing system in Taiwan into a giant large monitoring system. So that was the part where we worked the hardest and we got the most budget from. And it came out to be that I grew my team with this budget. And following, following the success of this project and in this year, the IUU was lifted, so we had extra time to come and talk and see if we have other opportunities and do something else, because actually we're quite tired doing that monitoring system over and over again. Okay, so this is just a brief, brief overview of how our project, and we cover almost every single piece of ocean, so from, the, from our um, inland into the coastal and into the overseas. And this is actually my team composition. So it's not a very big team. So I am the director of this team. So I lead. And over here, we have people that you can speak to with this day. It's my research assistant. He actually, he does the monitoring system and he oversees how it works. And we have our PhD student, which is 
um, specialized in doing the GIS sector. So how do you integrate the data and put it on the map? And we have a master's student who is, is specialized in um, um, processing those large um, coastal data. I will show you how the data would look like in the map. Okay. So do we enjoy this step? Well, actually, this is what happened to us. We, computer programmers tend to age faster than other people. So yeah, we enjoy it and it's not stressful. So you guys just stay calm. And good thing that my team is not big, but we hold almost all the data projects in Taiwan. So good thing that my team is not like this. It's not that one person that does 99% of the work. And how we worked, this is how we worked. And it's exactly what, when I was in the hospital last year, the fisheries agency called me and said, can I change or modify this data? And I was actually in this condition. Well, actually I was in bed and with the IV stuck to me and I, with the laptop and I started modifying the data. Okay, so we have other pro collaborators currently working with me for the fishing data. So this is actually a fish, fishing department professor. He specialized in coastal fishing, especially in the Northern Taiwan, those torchlight fisheries. And why would I get more people? This slide is very much discouraging because computer scientists are usually single. So everybody sees this and says, I don't want to do any program. I want to have a life. Okay, recent accomplishment of our team is that our, this is the monitoring system in Taiwan that we created in the fisheries agency. And so we have a center with the, a globe showing where our fishing vessels are currently now. And with this system, we have successfully lift the yellow card warning. So actually Taiwan is now free to sell its fishing products over to the European nations. Okay, this is just a simple and funny description of my team. Let's get back to business. Okay, the coastal and offshore sector. So this thing is that um, these vessels operate within the EEZ declared by Taiwan. As everybody knows that it is very complicated around Taiwan. We have China, we have Japan, and we have Philippines in the south. So it's actually a conflicted zone. And before we go through that, the Taiwan fishing vessels are classified into these categories. And I will be focusing on vessels that are smaller than CT4. And this means that it's less than five gross tonnage. It's measured by how much capacity the fishing vessel can hold within its cargo space. And for these small ones, like these sampans and PVC rafts, you can see those um, sampans, there's quite off, you can quite see them in Malaysian coast. Those are small boats that looks like a leaf and they can roll or put an outboard motor and go out to the seas. And just to have a single view, I translated the slide into US dollars. This is the fishing value estimated by the Taiwan government. So the total value is um, 2.9 billion US dollars per year. And for these coastal and offshore fisheries, it's, um, no, this is XR4. It's, only 130 million plus 422 million dollars. So it's actually not that a big deal, but still it supports a lot of families and how, um, and a lot of business that's going on. Okay, now let me introduce, how do we mon manage or monitor these coastal fisheries? We use a device called the Voyage Data Recorders. And these Voyage Data Recorders, they are very, very simple device that they only record the position of the fishing vessels. So. It's just nothing, it's just only a simple garment or something, GPS tracker with no other function, no, not functionalities. So it looks like this. This is the VDR device, and this is the device of a computer that reads the VDR device once it has been returned back to the fishing ports. So this VDR device, what's the biggest problem is that it is not instantaneous data, it's downloaded data, so the vessel how do they download the data? They have to come to fishing ports with those fueling stations. And if they want, the, want to fuel, they have to return the VDR data to the government. So the VDR work system works like this. If you return the VDR data to the government, you will get a fuel subsidy, which is actually quite a large amount. And this, this problem is that um, if you receive the subsidy, there's two options that you could do it. One is that you return the VDR. Second, you do not return the VDR, but you receive a less subsidy, a fixed amount of quota, because it's a free country. You cannot force those people to return the VDR data without law. And this law will not pass because the fishermen, they have votes in their hands. So if you want to pass this law, they're gonna vote against you. So this is a very complicated problem. Science and people, there's different. So the VDR system did not work because some people opt out to 
um, to submit the data, especially those PVC rafts or sandpans, those smaller vessels, they do not travel far. So by getting the fixed amount of quota, they actually receive more subsidy than they should. They should. So this is the biggest problem. Second problem is that people are afraid to be prosecuted, for example, entering marine protected zones or violating any fisheries law. And the third is that um, these devices, when they're on the sea, they actually break down pretty often. So you have to change with the backup device. When that, the, how the government operates is that if you change the backup device, the device IDs are not recorded in, uh, exactly at the time of the change. So we have to guess when did this vessel change the device? So this device change, that means that we, it's harder for us to track those fishing vessels. And it makes a time lapse about two to three days. So you have to guess which this new device, where is it, and which boat it pertains to. And the fourth one, the most important, is that these devices require power supplies. So for those smaller vessels, those small scale fisheries, those vessels do not have any power. And how do we solve this problem? We brought the iFish project and to have those carryable and portable devices with battery power with them. Okay, for a simple understanding how the scale of our VDR system is that, you can see that we have around 1,000, um, that's nearly 14,000 distinct IDs, so we have 14,000 devices. And that does, that does not mean that we monitor that many vessels because the device can change from boat to boat. And by using a simple statistics, we estimated that we have around 8,000 distinct vessels and for each month, we have actively working vessels around the number of 5,000. So we track about 5,000 um, offshore vessels per month. And the data set we have is that starting from 2007 to now, it's 6.9 billion. So I believe when I'm standing at this point, it has exceeded 7 billion data. data. And the structure of VDR system, this is for computer science students to see that how complex the system is. But this is not the most complex system we have. So we divide it into a few sections that we have manual data, automatic data, and how we do it in the back end. So just skipping all these technical details, let's see what the VDR management system does. So our management system, for example, in this slide, this shows those smaller vessels, CT0, that's five, less than five gross tonnage, and the distribution and the operating hours around Taiwan. So by this, you can see that um, in Penhu, this is the most major where the vessels are, and it's show in red. So these vessels operate a lot in this area. And in northern Taiwan, this is the torchlight fishery area where they catch squids. So we can analyze where's the hotspot of Taiwan. And for the BDR management systems, let's see. Um, yeah. OK, this is our system. That, so you can browse it through the, our website. And it's not open, sorry, because it's government data. But we provide this interface. You can zoom into the regions. and take a closer view of the distribution. So it's operated in 3D, so it's actually quite smooth. So just take a simple look around this system. Okay. Next slide. Okay. okay, so in the last slide, what you saw was the histogram of the fishing vessel. So it's actually discretized into 0 0.01 grid sites. But if you're interested in the trajectory, actual trajectory of the system, um, yeah, this one. So we also can show all the trajectories together. So this data is the one year trajectory data of all those CT0 vessels, and there's approximately 1,300 of them. So we mapped all those data onto this map. So this thing is much, much more confidential because the government does not want you to see where the vessels have actually traveled. So if you want the data from the government, they usually give you the histogram version. And for these vessels, it's quite amazing. That small vessel, how did they travel that far? It's still a question mark. Yeah. Okay, now the next slide. Now this is the VDR, man, the other system. This one is the fueling system. We see that, I just mentioned that. How do we collect the data? The data is uploaded to the central system if the fishing vessel goes into the fuel depot to ask for more fuel. And so their data is uploaded into our system and our system can just analyze this data directly. So this thing selects from which day, the uploading day of the data and it lists all these vessels, which vessels has uploaded their data. And by selecting the specific vessel, we 
analyze the data and partition the vessels into trips. So this is one trip, but when they upload the data, it can contain multiple trips. So we use this data to match with our catch or landing reports to see where the fishing vessel was operating or where the fish was distributed. So we split up the data into where the fish, fishing boat is in the port and where the fishing boat is operating outside the sea. So our system is capable of just simply partitioning this routes into what we need and what we want. So you can see that this vessel, sometimes it operates in the northern part of Taiwan, it sometimes operates in the eastern part of Taiwan. There's no definite fishing zones that they would select. They can go nearly anywhere where they want. And also we have this management interface. This is primarily for the government. They want to know the fishing hours of each fishing vessels. So we can see that some vessels, they work very, very hard, and some vessels, they do not work that hard. And so we use the statistics to see which vessels and their compensation for oil, is it reasonable, and their catch, the number of catch, do they work harder and get higher CPUE, or, they, or actually they get the same CPUE as working as less. Okay, now for this histogram version, and as computer science students, we see, we see to see, mm, seem to see that can we, Make the, make the resolution of our data higher and higher. So before, prior to joining the fisheries agencies, this is how they do statistics. They partition the grid um, of, the, of the globe into 0 0.1 degrees by 0 0.1 degrees. But for this resolution, you can see that Taiwan is actually only two degrees wide. There's only 20 points. Actually, this data, when you look at this data, it actually means almost nothing. You only see that oh, you know, there's only a few points of interest. But when we join this team, let's see, okay, the next slide. Okay. okay, we increase our resolution to 0 0.01 degrees by 0 0.01 degrees. The computation power required is 100 times more because it's in a 2D, it's 10 times 10, much more. So with this information, you can see um, the data has much more expressiveness. You, and it's not just a single point. You see that the operation points is actually this, this, and these areas. But for our ambition, which we haven't gone through yet, not very successful, we tried this, the 0 0.001 degree visualization. So under this visualization, it's actually, you need a very large amount of data to have things accumulated. The biggest problem with the 0 0.001 grid is that um, it, it's, an, it's an oversampling of our VDR device. Our VDR device is sampled every three minutes, so the vessel can travel from one grid to another grid. It's discrete, so you can actually see, um, if, when I enlarge it, you can see the trajectories of the fishing vessels. So by, if many vessels operate in this area, then the big the, by big data or the, by the data of normalization or the law of large numbers, we can accumulate some important fishing zones by this very, very detailed data. But this thing requires 100 times more than the 0 0.01 computation power. So we're not very through with this technology yet, but it works for some small regions. So just going through those power vessels, this slide, I actually seen this one last time. For, we're focused on how about these unpowered vessels. These are called sampans and these are called PVC fishing rafts. Those rafts, they are actually PVC pipes. You know, those large pipes you see in toilets. They are formed from those pieces, and a large number of these rafts exist in Taiwan, and they are not monetized. So they are actually invisible. Their catch is invisible. Everything is invisible. We should know how much fish they catch and what impact they do to our sectors. But this is not the most crazy ones. The most crazy ones are these types of vessels. These are styrofoam vessels. Can you imagine sitting on a styrofoam, going out to the open sea and fishing? Yeah, they even have a cooler over here. And if you think this is not crazy enough, this is what we had last year. This is our upgraded version of the styrofoam boats. And these boats are very dangerous because first, they are not registered with the country. Second, they do not have a tracking device. Second, third, they do not have safety measures on the vessels. So once you, get, um, you fall down or you get overboarded, that's too bad. And actually, people really died from doing fishing on these types of vessels. And this is only an upgrade of the vessel saying that they have a red light because they operate during the night. So those larger vessels can see them. And I believe my students, when they went out to sea, they saw some of these vessels operating. So unbelievable. They're making these styrofoam boats larger and larger. So our proposed solution was to create an IoT or Internet of Things device, a smaller um, tracking device that it can sustain itself with its better power. But since we already designed this 
hardware. The last video hardware existed in 2007. That's nearly 10 years ago. And its RAM capacity is very small. It only has eight megabytes of RAM. Imagine that it's less than one picture that you take on your, um, on your digital camera. So it's unbelievable how, ten, how can they make the RAM so small on that device and keep using it up to this state. And so we proposed a new solution that it increases the RAM size, increases the computation power. So we came up with this simple device. It's a device, it's a, a simple um, IoT, it's called Raspberry Pi Zero device, and we connected all these sorts of sensors together and hope to make it work. Okay, skipping the detail. This is how this device looks like now. It's the second generation, different from the one that I showed to Alex last year. So it's actually a very, very small, it's hold a palm size and it's able to read RFID cards. And what are these cards for? Well, you know, if you have contract with the government, they ask for more and more. They hope that your device can keep track of the crews on the vessels. So, okay, then let's use RFID. And they say that, how do you verify the RFID? Well the Coast Guard will have to board the vessel and check it. I don't have any other solution besides physical checking. And the obstacle of, of developing this project is still this problem over here, power, power supply. How can we have the device operate over one day? Because the fishermen can operate outside in the, uh, in the open seas for at least 14 hours. And look at this Nokia, 1% of battery and it can operate for 12 hours. And believe that, your smartphone right now, there's no smartphone that can do this part, that can operate at this efficiency. And the most important is Wi-Fi. How do you relay the information back to our central station? So we only have 4G. And we also, cons they consider using satellites, but say, who's gonna pay for this satellite communication? Nobody is gonna pay, so that's very really too bad. Okay, now, I asked my students to do a test with this device, and. Here's like quite crazy with the motorbike, you roll from the north, our campus is over here, back to Taipei City, and back to Xinchu, another campus, um, Chaotong University over here, and went into the mountains, came back to Taipei, and went back to our campus, and went outside over to the seas. So this is just to test that, is our, is our device stable enough, and can it handle over 12 hours of operating hours? Yes, well the solution, yes. And next, ocean test. Everything has to be tested on the ocean to see if it actually works. The ocean condition is very different from the lab, so we choose a recreational pole and line fishing boat and send those students out. Well, I have to give them applause because they are the first computer science students that has to go onto the sea to complete their experiments. And this is how they work. They even brought a laptop into the <laughs> onto the fishing vessel and did some debugging, the last minute preparations. And this is what the vessel looks like. So it's actually rather safe on these larger vessels because CT2 is actually four times, um, 16 times larger than those spam pans or CT0 vessels. So it's actually relatively safe. And this is the wide. So from this board, the starboard to the port side, it, you can fit at least one car. It's one car wide. And by developing this device, we also have to develop the monitoring center to accept this kind of data. So I was the lucky one who gets to stay in the lab and take a look at the monitoring device. And they were the ones that had to go onto the sea. And, we, and it's just quite embarrassing that we still use cell phone to, com to communicate, say, where are you right now? And I have to check that if the position is correct. So on our, on our system, you can see that if, if we carry that, those onboard devices, it relays the information. So, this place, this is where the boat is right now, and it travels from this place. This is the, where the Coast Guard is. You have to say that you want to go out for fishing and do all the paperwork and tracking and going step by step and outside to the, to the open seas. Okay, now it goes out to the open seas. So I just did a simple testing. Is that how long or how range efficient is our device? Because they've announced range for 4G networks, they say that it could reach at least five nautical miles. But we're trying to confirm, does it actually reach five nautical miles? Well, it doesn't work that well because this distance is not really far. It's only three kilometers. That's only considered two nautical miles with only one point something like that. And sometimes the signal just gets lost because the ocean condition and the, where you place the device, if you place it too low onto the vessels, the device will have difficulties communicating with the, uh, the base stations of the cell phone. So they changed two positions. The first 
anchorage precision and the second anchorage precision. So I just measured where these places are. And this is where we did our first test. We put it on the starboard side of the vessel and they're traveling on the seas. And this is the Indonesian um, captain over here and he's just in charge of leading the boat and where, seeing where the fish, those fishermen can catch. Um, the ocean waves are to show the fishing agencies that our device can work with water conditions. Okay, now this is the port entry test and we just discovered one thing that screens are not that efficient on the sea because nobody looks at the screens and it's, if it's filled with ocean water, actually you can see nothing on it. So maybe we want to remove the screen and use some other measures of displaying information. And this is the device when we carry it back to our lab, it's filled with salt and everything. So the first test they had, we have the complete trajectories. And with this data, we tried, tried to analyze it. Then let's take an analyze of this data. So every, for this device, it's much thinner. Every single point represents 10 seconds, 10 seconds interval. So at this place where the vessel has stopped to fishing, the vessel is actually not moving, but the anchor of the vessel does not reach the bottom of the sea, so it's actually drifting. So we can conclude that they drifted over this place, and this place, this, the total speed should be zero, and it, it's their fishing ground. But if you do an interpolation from this time to time, this, this position to this position, actually the speed is not zero because you are actually drifting. So by collecting the GPS data, the instantaneous speed is zero, but by using mathematics to compute, the vessel is moving. So this makes our estimation of is the vessel fishing, steaming, or staying on the ground very, very difficult because it's act and the ocean currents makes a lot of difference. So if you see a cutoff point, if it's under two nautical miles per hour, we assume that it's fishing. But if the ocean currents exceeds this value, we'll consider it as a moving fishing vessel. So current information sometimes may need to be used to recalibrate the data back or compute, or compute the vectors back to the original amount of speed or moving time. And this is the second test where we have a better developed system that it's an automatic system. So you just watch, like watching TV where the vessel goes and every single point it moves, it draws a trajectory and you know where the vessel is. And the second time, okay. The second time when I sent those research assistants out to the sea, this is how the condition was. The weather report says that it's a sunny day but I don't know what happened, it's the rough oceans. The wave heights were around five to seven meters and they all got wet. And this is how they work under the condition. When they signed up for computer science, they never expected this is how computer science would look like. So on the second test, this is the drift on the sea mapping of our trajectory. And if we change it to another map, you can see that the vessel actually stopped at this place. And this is a period of 10 minutes the vessel almost drift onto the land. So I just call them, I'll send them messages, say that, tell the captain to not move or don't turn off the outboard motor. And after 10 minutes, I'll be waiting for you right here on the land. So this thing really makes a lot of difference in our estimation. So we now we have extra information for those small vessels and that's close to the land. You cannot just use pure speed to classify it into is it fishing or is it not, it's not fishing. Okay, so this is the drift. When we zoom into it, so they, they stopped at this point and it drifted up to the northern town and it drifted back. So you can see the current is all messy, messed up. Okay, now about this project. This was a rush to project that I received last year and we only had five months to complete the project and report it to the government. Well, this is what happened. Wow, it was a good idea. And when we started in, this thing does not fit. We have to go to an ocean. Man, it's the dark night. Who's gonna go out to the ocean and how does the device work? What if the device breaks down on the ocean and nobody's gonna fix it? Well, actually, finally, it turned out. Well, it's done and it sucks, but it's not that bad. <laughs> That's our conclusion for this project. And we're just waiting for the government to provide more funding to do on the third or fourth test on that device. And by going out to the seas, we, we also get some trophies. So when they're testing the device, they also do a pole and line fishing and they cut all these Fish. But these fishes are not reported to the authorities as all small scale fisheries are in Taiwan. So these are bycatches, they are actually invisible. And there's a lot of this fish going down, down in, our, in, in Keelong in the northern Taiwan every day. There are recreational fishing fishermen catching a lot of fish every day unreported. And I believe if the amount of reported amount, it could exceed 
the amount reported in Leslie Timor, this invisible amount. Okay, now passing away from the VDR, VDR thing, we have back to the data analytics and GIS. So what do we do with this project? The government now has VDR. They have landing reports. They have auction reports. They say, can you put these things together and make the data useful for us? And the government has a thing called the national GIS system. The biggest problem about the national GIS system in Taiwan is that it's based on our GIS. And our fishing data is so large that you cannot put data onto their system. So we had to develop a sub site system a, another system that's for internal use by the government, which replaces the ArcGIS. You know, governments operate in a weird way. They have a system over there, and you have to display something onto that system in order to complete the project and to meet the requirements. But the system itself cannot sustain such a large amount of data, so you have to create another system to, for them to use to meet the requirement. But still, the original system is there, and it does not contain any data. So it's just a very complicated thing over there, so just, just let it go. And we always hope the government gives the funding this way. You know, the original funding full of everything, and the second following up project, you get an expansion package where you want to add more data. But how do we receive the funding from the government this way? We said, can you create a simple system with nothing and very, very low budget and say, can you add this thing? Can you add this, add this, add this? So it makes our system a humongous system and it's all messed up because they give the budget small, small, small and you add everything together, you don't get the, by adding all this thing together, you don't get this, okay? You don't get this thing. So it makes our work difficult. Anyways, even though it's difficult, we still have to make something complete. So the private and I comment out at the end, it's not a national GIS system. It's an internal private use national GIS system. So this thing that we have this database and it visualizes the coastal fishery, the condition of Taiwan. So we added some set net and catch data. So those set nets are those nets set outside Taiwan. So they, they, are, they need to be approved first by the government where you can set those set nets. And from the VDR data, we catch and auction reports. We try to derive or by our model, we compute where the fishermen are operating, the type of gear that they're using, the fish that they have catched in those regions. So there are a few general assumptions. Okay, the general assumptions is that starting from this project, the government provided enough funds to supply 400 vessels to collect sample data. Okay, that part was pretty good, pretty nice, and it's five years ago. And three years ago, they cut the budget, so originally you can collect 400 400 sample data per year, you can only collect 240 vessels per year. Remember, VDR data, every year there's around 8,000 vessels. So you're trying to approximate 8,000 vessels with 400 and now by 240. And not to make things worse, they further cut the budget to zero. So they do not supply any sample vessels. So we, only we can only derive the data purely from those auction records. So we have to do some best match to create the, recreate the condition where the fisherman was working. The government always operate in an ideal mode. So they say that you already have these past data, so can you use the past data to approximate the future? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I just did things through and it's up to the fisheries teachers to see that if the data is correct or not. So we, the major data that we use now is the market data and the, S and the auction data. Why is this good and accurate is because if the fisherman wants to sell the fish within the range, within the fisheries association, they have to pay a commission. And the commission is the amount of fish that reported. So either side, if the fisherman underreports, the fishery association will say that, no, 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 you do not underreport because we're going to receive less money. And if the fisheries associ association overreports, the fisherman says, that, no, no, we're not going to pay extra money. So by these two forces pulling together, I believe the number is correct in this sense. So we use this data to ratchet back to the trajectory information to derive where the fishes exist and how they work. So the second difference is that there is no standard. The data that we collect from the different fisheries associations across Taiwan are not compatible. They are in different formats there, in different columns. Some are in different units. Some measures fish in the number of fish some measures in, in kil kilograms of the fish catch. So we have to convert this data back. And what are computer science students for? You've seen this slide. 
there is always a way to make things compatible. So we have all these interfaces to make every single piece of data fit where they should. So now, we created this, this is the first view, that is the setNet data. So with this position mark is that these are authorized positions where you can set up those set nets. And it's, so it's actually in GIS and there's a square over here. So you can set up set nets anywhere in this region. And if you set it outside this region, you will be fine. Now for this, for this database, you can also browse by fish types. Okay, here by selection, selecting one fish. Oh, it did not, ex it did not appear on the screen capture. Let's see. Okay, for this simple first type of fish, it's, um, I can't see it. It's a type of swordfish. So if it marks in blue, it means that this type of fish farm reported this catch in that certain month. And also, by the another way of analysis, you can see that which fish farms are more efficient than others. So maybe you can provide this technology to those smaller islands, tell them how to set up those set nets and have these catches every month. Quite efficient. Okay, let's, um, there's no scaling, okay. Now this is the amount of catch reported per month. So the types of fish and the weight of the fish. So we have this full database over here that how this set net works. And you see that these set nets in the northern Taiwan, they are much, much more efficiency than those ones in the southern Taiwan. They make a lot of money, it's all these types of fish, different types of fish that they catch. Okay. Now for the VDR histogram, I did not make an animation of this one, but this is where we track Taiwan's small scale fishing vessels and where they have been. So you see that Mostly they are focused within these regions, but some vessels actually travel south. And you can see a, a curve over here. This thing is the Philippine and Taiwan EZ boundary. So they operate outside this boundary and they do not interbounds. They're very efficient on not stepping on the line. So Taiwan, in Taiwan, the small fishing vessels, they can travel rather far. And for this one that goes over here, that, they are larger vessels, they are CT4 class. Some CT4 are required to install VDRs because they enter Japan, Japan EZZs, and Japan requires our government to have those installed because we have an, this area that's a, that's a contracted area that we discuss with Japan every year, say how many fishes both we can go in and how many they can go because it's a conflict zone that we resolve it by discussing it over the table. So this system also provides an insight for our government to negotiate with Japan because they, in this region, they can actually swap A region for B region and we can see which region is better. For, okay. Now, and by individual vessels, these, these things, we have these search engines available. So even by distribution of macros. And I believe something that you might be more interesting is that we analyze in every single grid point which types of fish existed where on the grid. So in our data algorithms, we can compute this information and it can be used for further analysis to see that. Um, at which place there are more fish caught than other places. And for this one, this is the one that the government is interested in, using gillnets catch of mackerels because gillnets, they kill too many fishes. So they are trying to limit it, the amount of use of gillnet. So we did a simple, simple evolution of gillnets in Taiwan. I think it would it play. Yeah, it works. So this is a gillnet distribution of Taiwan from 2012 to 2017, where the gillnet existed. So in this place, it's where, where it mo majorly occurs. So we're trying to derive something useful from this information, the evolution of Taiwan fisheries or Taiwan gillnet fisheries throughout the five years. And just to mention one last thing, what makes our research very difficult? This is the handmade plot of one of my RAs. The fishery division of Taiwan is divided into one, two, three and four sections. Why is that? Because there are four scientists, each is specialized in one region. So it makes our data processing very, very difficult because every time we process data, we have to do a cut over here because um, the scientists are only allowed to receive the data from this area. Now, we cut the data into this four partition, we deliver it to the scientists, they compute the total catch, they send it back to our, to our um, lab team. What do we do next? we merge the data together. So we draw a question mark there. Why do we need to cut the data in the first place? 
Well, that's how it works. But good thing is that the funding has gone low. So the four regions has merged into one region and only one professor can get it. So it makes our work easier. We used to have to communicate with four professors. Now we only have to communicate with one. Okay, so segmentation. Segmentation data. Why do we need to segment the data to, into fishing and non-fishing zones? That's the key to where we estimate where the fish, fishing vessel is operating, where the fish was produced. But this thing is actually very, very difficult because we've seen those papers. Some, some places they can speed, those speed uh, the fishing speed into three modes, three, three different speeds. And we applied the same algorithm into Taiwan fishing vessel. We only get two different speeds. So in, or, in the original three speed model, it's fishing and steaming and one, one way it's, it's called resting or stationary. But in Taiwan, we only have fishing and steaming. Well, they don't really need to rest. So this model actually fails in Taiwan. So actually, I'm forcing my students to feel like this. They're doing something that is out of their age. So they do not understand what is happening. So just, um, just so three more last slides. And this one is, we came up with another word, called curvature identification for segmentation. This is the thing that we're working right now. Do we have an automatic method without other support of information to partition the trajectory into operating trajectory and non-operating trajectory? So this is just really simple math. It's just the cosine law. So the basic idea is that we see that by, dip, by by relative points, we can draw a circle and see how curved it is. You know, for some fisheries, they, when they lay the nets, they have to travel in a straight line. So by this simple observation, and this is also in one year data of a, one single vessel, and we change the curvature with it displays display, points over here where it could be possibly operating and we have to change its curvature value. Now, this is the place where the artificial intelligence should come in. We need sample data to train this model to select the best parameters. Because for different parameters, you have different number of visualizations. So if you see that, if I adjust the curvature, you have more and more points. And where is the best cutoff? I do not know. And for different types of fisheries, there should be a different type of cutoff. So for this thing, I would just like to stop right here because it's called an algorithm. And in computer science, this is what an algorithm means. It means that a word used by programmers that they don't want to explain what they just did. Okay, so I think the time is quite limited, so I would skip the overseas, overseas section and the application. So if you're interested, I would be here the whole day and you can come and talk and see if you want to know more how our system could help the government do some decisioning supports. Okay, let's stop right here. Okay, thank you.